So uh, Roger and Brad have asked me to touch a bit on F10, New South Wales, and to put up, I guess, some tips for your consideration as coaches uh, to really help with the holistic development of your emerging athletes. So before I start, can you guys hear me okay? All good? Excellent. Thanks, Mick. Thanks for the thumbs up. Okay, so let's get into it. Okay, so the F10 framework, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with the F10 framework that we put together at the Australian Institute of Sport. Yeah, it was around 2011, 2012. And there was a critical need to put a, a practical framework together to support the work we were doing with national sporting organisations at that time. You know, a whole of sport framework that was based on best practice and gave guidance to everyone uh, supporting participants and athletes. So just to break it down, I guess the F levels, F1 to F3, is all about a best practice approach and an evidence-based approach to developing the foundations of sport that leads into lifelong engagement in sport and physical activity, but also provides those critical foundations that is the platform for future high performance success. So within this, it's all, it speaks to having a full repertoire of fundamental movement skills and the competencies of those uh, for children, uh, but also about uh, physical literacy and development of physical literacy and maintenance of physical literacy through the lifespan. At the T levels, uh, which stands for talent, are four specific levels, and we're really going to unpack that today in this session. Uh, this is all about having an effective talent pipeline. So those foundational gifted athletes that want to go into the high performance levels, they have to go through this pre-elite sort of uh, phases. And this is about um, giving them inclusive talent ID opportunities at the T1, about confirming their talent uh, potential and whether they're ready for the step up into pre-elite development. Uh, T3 is all about holistic integrated pre-elite development. And T4 is a critical point where they have a breakthrough event and it's about readying them in a holistic way for that transition from a junior elite level up into the senior elite levels. And at the pinnacle of F10 are our elite and mastery levels. So this is really about, again, a holistic and integrated approach to supporting our very finest athletes in Australia and to be able to support them in having uh, success at the highest levels uh, perennially over multiple high performance um, cycles. Also critically, um, it's important to draw on these athletes, to engage with them, um, to learn from their experiences and that then is utilised to inform the underpinning uh, talent uh, strategies and high performance strategies as well. So F the F10 framework really provides a systems approach uh, to uh, sport development and participant development. It's a way to visualise, you know, the steps uh, that are involved and also it helps to visualise the opportunities at each level as well. It's complementary in its coverage because it, it recognises the importance of having an active lifestyle along with recreational sport and high um, performance sport. It's very holistic in its philosophy, as I touched on earlier, and it really is about uh, promoting physical literacy for the participant through life all the way up to a senior level, but also the importance of physical literacy for a high performance athlete. While it does look linear, it's not in terms of its concept and application. So what it's all about is because we know that, you know, participants and athletes have a variance of trajectory, you know, in their journey in sport and their development. And it would be nearly impossible to cover all that, you know, in a framework. But what F10 provides is wherever that participant is at that time or athlete, it's about giving them the right support at the right time. And that's where uh, F10 really affords great flexibility and a right match of support, you know, for the participant athlete. It's deliberately not uh, based on chronological age because again, we know from the research we've done and the research globally, there is great variance in ages 
So it makes it too restricted to put ages on there. But it's really about uh, drawing on global best practice, you know, our experiential learning as well, and using that to, to get the right result at that level. So it's about drawing contemporary best practice and giving the best chance to the participant and athlete. And most importantly, too, F10 is inclusive in coverage. Not only does it support the journey of an athlete, an able-bodied athlete, but it also supports of a Paralympic athlete as well. More recently, and I've been, um, it's been wonderful to work in the New South Wales Office of Sport, we've taken the liberty to put together an F10 New South Wales, uh, which you can see on our screen here, and that you can access from our Pathways and Development web pages that are now live uh, in the Office of Sport uh, website. But you can see here, we've got a bit more commentary to the levels. We've got a bit, bit more of a complement of the recreational sport offerings that participants can do at a young age, an adult and a senior. Um, but also wonderf we wonderfully recognise our wonderful ambassadors that are representing actually at the Paralympics Olympics. So we've got Madison D. Rosario there, our wonderful Paralympic wheelchair racer, and Jessica Fox. So with F10, and I touched on it before, it really is a systems approach. We understand with the athlete in the middle, they can't do it all on their own. They require the right fit of environmental support. So whether it be parents, schools, coaches, peers, the right fit of daily training environment, practitioners and so forth, they need that environmental support uh, that needs to be coordinated, integrated and best practice to really nurture their holistic uh, profile. And then importantly, surrounding that, enveloping both is the system level support. And this is the coordination, the leadership through, shown through national sporting organisations, but also at the government levels as well about policy and funding about having a good evidence base and about great facilities. So it all works together and F10 really helps to articulate this and it helps to empower and integrate and coordinate all of these for the betterment of the participant and athlete at the centre. Now today we're gonna to touch on specifically uh, how the F10 New South Wales best practice relates to you as a coach. Now you coaches are critical to the success of the implementation of F10 New South Wales. And I consider that the F10 New South Wales framework and its guiding principles are really important for you as a coach, you know, to understand where your participant or athlete is on their developmental journey. So what level are they at and what nurturing do they require? But also importantly, understanding their motivation, aspiration, which you know actually informs greatly your delivery and your approach with that individual participant and athlete. It also informs your role and your approach. So how you're going to support that participant or athlete. So your focus, how you're going to deliver it and who's going to support you in doing that. And also importantly, it supports the linkage and the collaboration of yourself with sporting organizations, with practitioners to all work together to support you in supporting the athlete. And just to say, uh, we're just about to launch our Future Champions Action Plan. It's our first action plan from the strategy. And in that, we've been working away, building some resources, and very pleased to say that uh, very soon we'll be able to share with you some comprehensive resources that really unpack that system approach to FTM New South Wales. So, and we will also have our resources for coaches and instructors. So, based on FTM, and best practice, but also informed by the great guidance like Mick, um, who will be presenting to you a little bit later. We wanted to make sure that these considerations that we offer, you know, are guided by best practice, but also feasible and practical for you as a coach. But today, what I'm going to focus on is the talent levels. And so we're going to unpack some of those recommendations that I've actually got um, in these resources that we'll be able to share with you very soon. In the resource, we really unpack uh, the talent levels. And what I've got here is a schematic 
of the talent pipeline. And as I touched on before, the T levels are not at really a chronology or a competition ages or competition levels. It's really about a best practice approach to really ensure we've got strong talent pipelines in our system. So at the start, it's about inclusive talent ID and doing it in a valid and reliable way. But also importantly, those initial predictions of talent are verified through holistic uh, approaches. It's really important, the combination of talent ID and, and follow-up ver talent verification within practice, within competition, to really inform effectively your talent selection uh, decisions. Today, in the rest of my uh, presentation, I'm going to really focus on talent development that does happen in T2, but mostly happens in the T3 level. And this is where once you've identified and confirmed a talent, you pop them in this, in, in this wonderful environment, such as uh, the sport high schools uh, programs, to really nurture that the athlete's holistic uh, development. And then T4, um, how you can ready that pre-elite athlete and support them in their next step up and their progression into the senior elite levels. Now, I note down the bottom here that while we've got, it looks like we've, it's a linear process and we've got four levels, that in reality, uh, pre-elite athletes might go through this uh, process many times. They might get up to a certain level at an age group and then go back down, you know, to go up to the next level. Or they might drop out or they might come back in as a talent transfer athlete. So while this looks linear, it affords that uh, flexibility and the variability of trajectory of our pre-lead athletes. So I've got some questions for you guys as coaches, and I know you guys will be all over it. And, and I'm just using Danny Samuels, wonderful alumni um, from uh, Westfields High School as backdrop. So some, some questions I'll put to you is, do you understand uh, the required athlete profile underpinning elite performance? Do you understand in a very holistic and integrated way? Following on that, do you have a dedicated and individualised development and transitional plan specific to each of, of your athletes? And are you sure that everyone is on the same page with that? What can you do to nurture and support and empower your pre-elite athlete profile? And then finally, how do you know if you and the athlete are on, the, on, the, on track and what informs your decision making? So there's four key questions that I want you uh, to consider, but we're going to now uh, touch on um, some suggestions and tips for, for each of those. So we now know from extensive research over the last few decades, my own PhD, uh, the work I've been doing, you know, at, with NSOs and, uh, and SSOs in New South Wales, we know that what it takes to win requires a holistic and integrated athlete profile with all these dimensions. We know it takes uh, to have a favourable developmental background, a good fundamental movement skills, good physical literacy, sports sampling before specialisation, lots of investment in free play, early competition progression and lots of competition exposure. We also know that you need to have the right fit of physicality. This is not just your anthropometrics, your height, your weight, but it's also about your neuromuscular robustness. So it's about stability and strength and posture and about recoverability and coordination control. It's also about having the right fit of engine as well. But also importantly, it's not just the physical and the foundational uh, experiences. It's also importantly the sport specific skills. So having the right fit and synchrony of perceptual skills. So a reading an opponent uh, with decision making skills that, and then technical skills. So the marrying up of perceptual decision making, cognitive skills and technical skill execution. You, at the elite level, this has to be at the automatic level know where it's it's at the level of a subconscious um, a conscious thought and you need to be able to do this time and time again um, in different scenarios under fatigue under pressure you need to be able to do this 
and repeat it and to be able to adapt it as well. Also importantly, you have to be a great ambassador. You have to live great uh, NSO and Olympic values. You need to be super organised, self-managed. You need to have good sport life balance, particularly if you're a student athlete. You need to be able to deal with multiple stressors and you need to have phenomenal knowledge that you put into practice what it takes to be an athlete. And then I think the key thing for me that I found from all my research over the many years, and I'm sure that Stephen will speak to um, later, is having the right psychological characteristics and skills. Again, very multidimensional. We've found that this is critical to high performance and indeed actually getting to that point as well. So as you can see, really what it takes is a multidimensional and integrated athlete profile. Now, drawing on the work I did with Cricket Australia for my PhD, I got to talk to the greats, Justin Langer, Greg Chappell, to name a few. I put a model together and I tested that model empirically with over 111, 112 uh, batsmen across age. And this is the model that I came up with. This is all evidence-based. And again, you can see to reach an expert level of batting in cricket internationally requires all these dimensions. And you can see the green arrows. So while each dimension is important, sub-dimension, there's interactions and relatedness between uh, the different dimensions. You know, all work together to get that expert level of performance. And then more recently, I've had the great pleasure um, to supervise one of my PhD students, Dr. Lauren Burns now. She's just gotten her PhD. You remember her from Sydney when she won gold. But again, her research has shown from interviewing 14 of our finest athletes in Australian history in sport that, again, it's multidimensional. The sweet spot to hit performance really is a blend of performance, relationships, the psychology of the athlete, and also importantly, balance of uh, their lifestyle. So why is having an understanding of the, uh, the multidimensional athlete profile important? Well, it's critically important. Uh, it informs and informs what should be happening at the foundational levels uh, to inform strategy and your delivery as a coach. But also this profile informs your talent selection strategies, your talent development strategies, how you're going to negotiate and support transition of that athlete and your high performance strategies. Most importantly, it it's informs what you do as a coach, your focus, your scope of delivery. I wrote a chapter on this uh, for the Rutledge International Handbook of Talent ID in 2017, uh, where I use athlete profiling, what it takes to win that profile to then inform underpinning strategy. So if you're interested in that book chapter, I can certainly send it your way. So while, while the um, what it takes to win profiles are critically important, there's some key considerations that you need to take, take on. So with the athletes that you're supporting at the moment, a lot of them won't be fully matured uh, biologically in terms of their, their physical maturation, but also psychologically as well. Also, they haven't had the right, um, that exposure and experience that will be coming, you know, with competition. So you have to be mindful that you can't just overlay that adult profile and expect that, you know, of your emerging athletes. Another point I will make and, and some great research to show that all profiles aren't the same, even at the elite level. They can be compensatory in nature. Some athletes might be very high in technical to make up maybe for a little shortfall in the physical. So just be mindful that there isn't a gold standard and a cookie cutter approach to profiles. And then finally, just when you're doing profiling, understand where your athlete as is in terms of their biological maturation and understand if you've got late maturing athletes that might be very good in terms of skill and psychology, they might not be up there just yet in terms of their physical and physiological. So just be mindful of that and obviously give late maturing athletes who ultimately are a lot of our finest athletes that affordance and that patience. Now, I want to draw on the great collaboration 
uh, that I have done with Mick uh, while he was at Triathlon New South Wales and just show you how an understanding of the athlete profiling for triathlon then led to some other great work that Mick led. So it informed his um, F10 model and framework, which is fantastic. And his framework that he put together was so successful in uh, really being clear on the expectations of all service providers supporting the athletes. Um, it led to an effective MOU established and wonderful collaboration uh, and coordination. It also informed a individual athlete development plan. So the profile informed uh, the dimensions that were, that were covered in, the, in that individual athlete development plan. The athlete profiling piece also informs some great education work that we did uh, with athletes and parents. And I had the great honour to present with Brendan Sexton, uh, Olympian uh, for triathlon, and to use his learnings and marry it into the profiling and then to give some great tips on uh, self-regulation, for instance. And then finally, uh, the profiling piece informed you know, our messaging uh, to parents and how they can support uh, their emerging athlete within their family. So the T3, let me go back to the, the T3 level of F10. So T3 is all about talent development. Now, we know it can be anywhere from one to eight years that an athlete can be in the developmental phase. It's all about using a deliberate programming approach with a very athlete-centric um, philosophy. And it's all about holistic and in integrated collaborative approach. At the top of it, uh, the first thing uh, that I've got there is the key thing in leadership of T3 is having an effective strategy and planning and management. It's having a talent development strategy, understanding who is doing what, how and when. Also importantly, at the individual level, it's about having an individual development plan or athlete performance plan. It's about ongoing athlete monitoring of athletes while you've got that plan in place to inform adaptive individualised case management. Critically important for, to inform for a coach. It's about quality and progressive camps and the marrying of competition calendars, but also importantly, it's about sector collaboration, you know, with SSOs, NSWIS, NSO uh, for the betterment of that athlete. It's also about effective coaching practice, and I'll, I'll uh, cover a few tips in a minute in regards to that, what you can consider. Your role is about equipping uh, these pre-elite athletes, supporting them and really empowering them, getting them ready for their next progressive steps up the pathway and their experiences and opportunities. It's about providing facilitative and daily training environments, so safe, progressive, embracing environments and positive culture. It's about engaging best practice athlete education, quality camps and progressive competition, dedicated educational initiatives for all support providers, including parents, and effective interdisciplinary case management. Similarly, for the T4 level, where the emerging athletes knocking on the door to transition up to the elite level, again, it's about having a plan and everyone being on that plan to support the transition of the athlete through a deliberate programming approach. It's about having a good understanding and learning from athletes that have gone through this before about the barriers and facilitators of transition. It's about dedicated transitional education for athletes. It's about effective and individualised case management. Most importantly, it's about uh, exposure at key events in competition to support athletes and get them ready for the step up and access to mentors. So as you can see, with the T3 and T4 level, there's a deliberate approach to this. And again, like the profile, it's very integrated and very coordinated to get the right outcome. So here are my tips for you guys as coaches, but I'm sure that you guys are all over this. But my first tip is train the brain. Now, I touched on this before. Look, we know from the research that I have done, the research globally, that the psychological skills and characteristics of an athlete, their competencies in those, is a recognised discriminator in elite level performance. 
is really what is required to support the journey, which can be have peaks and troughs in it. It can be arduous, but also to get the, the best performance at the very top. It also importantly, uh, psychological skills such as self-regulation, smart goal setting and visualisation helps learning, but it also helps with performance, but also outside of performance, self-management, confidence, resilience, and negotiating the transitions they've got in their pathway. It's a vital adjunct to physical and skill training. Uh, it's just as important, maybe even more important, to the physical body. It's critically important. It's another modality that you can use with an athlete if, for instance, at the moment they're not able to train uh, and compete through this lockdown. It's something they can work on right now or even if they're injured. It's, with such great research has shown with visualisation that there is a lack of detriment in performance and it can help with skill um, acquisition and refinement. And these skills are really important too. They're transferable and they're life skills as well. So touching on Lauren's great work where she interviewed 14 of our finest Olympic and Paralympic champions, and this is her paper here, so I can certainly send that through to you. She found a commonality of these athletes were that they were phenomenal self-regulators. A lot of these athletes, it was very interesting, they didn't realise they were, they were great self-regulators. Even Lauren herself didn't realise that. But they'd worked out this routine that you can see here, this cycle of self-regulation that really honed you know, their performance. So when I talk about self-regulation, it's a real complement of practical skills and strategies that facilitates learning, performance, the great thing about it from the research is that it does transfer into academic performance. So this is key skills for uh, supporting academic uh, prowess, prowess as well and their key life skills. So she found her athletes did this cyclical flow of self-regulation. So before an event, they were meticulous planners and, and prepared beautifully. You know, they had a strategy. They set smart goals. They used visualisation. So watching their performance in their mind's eye with different perspectives uh, was incredibly important uh, to their performance. During an event, they were phenomenal in terms of self-monitoring, their emotional regulation. After the event, they were very good to unpack their performance using different types of feedback. Did they meet their goals going into, into an event? And phenomenal in terms of the self-evaluation and talking who to, to who they need to to really evaluate their performance. And then finally, what was key was these athletes uh, looked at the strengths and weaknesses in their performance and where they're at. And they were meticulous and very assertive in sourcing uh, solutions to where they might have a gap and experimenting with potential solutions and so very assertive in uh, speaking to who they needed to and, um, and really recalibrating and adapting their approach. And this was not just in performance, but even their life, you know, the balance of their life with their performance. And she found, and, and we found through the research, that self-regulation is key, this cyclical approach to um, increasing self-belief, confidence and effort in athletes and it's all glued together with continual self-reflection so I'll just touch on that now so when I do a lot of education with coaches and with athletes and parents I draw on the Gibbs reflective cycle so a lot of you might be familiar with Gibbs reflective cycle I think that came out of the um, out of the academic uh, domain but these are great line of questioning here in this flow that you can use to facilitate your athletes' self-reflective processes. You can practice um, this line of questioning to the point where the athlete does it themselves and it's habitual uh, for the athlete. So you can ask them, uh, what was the event? How did you feel before, during and after the event? What worked well? What didn't work well? What did you learn importantly? What are some potential solutions that you need to experiment with and what will you do in preparation for next time? So a simple line of questioning uh, that uh, I know Mick has used 
uh, with his athletes and, and really effective in solidifying athletes' self-reflective uh, processes. Now, you can facilitate this by getting athletes to put it on the fridge or somewhere at home or at practice. I'll send it at the AIS at the back of the volleyball courts or even your athletes having online or actual hard copy uh, diaries are really effective as well. Now, to really hone an athlete's self-regulation, you need to have... Um, great facilitative learning environments. Now, I'm, I'm absolutely respectful and I really admire the great work that Kelly Cross does at Sydney FC. I've been really fortunate to observe what he does. And I, in my view, he's a phenomenal self-regulator and he's really great at facilitating athletes' self-regulation. So it's all about encouraging continual learning, problem-solving innovation, doing it in a challenging but constructive way, promoting athlete autonomy and responsibility, their responsibility and self-management, having respect and gratitude and being supportive and celebrating success together. It's about really importantly, if you're promoting self-regulation and particularly self-reflection, to know when to minimise and draw back on your direct feedback to an athlete. So it's really about getting the athlete to think about their performance in training or competition. So how did they go? What, what do they need to work on? What were their strengths? What can they do next time? So that's a critical message for me for coaches is to know when to draw back uh, in terms of your direct feedback. It's all about understanding too the power of observational learning as well. So this is where Kelly does a wonderful job. I've seen his training sessions where he has younger cohorts training with older cohorts and more skilled cohorts. So don't underplay the power of observational learning of your athletes as well through that vertical integration. Make sure you've got the IPP and it's a shared IPP that the athletes invested in and understands as well and they take ownership of their goals and then mentoring is critically important. And I know that Kelly has a mentoring program that goes so well with the coaches, with the athletes, and does that routinely, and it's incredibly effective. So as you can see, to facilitate an athlete's self-regulation, you need to be a good self-regulator yourself um, as a coach to facilitate the self-regulation, but these are all key skills for you as a coach as well. So I just wanted to make that point too. Now, just to touch on that, on the left there, from all the great work that um, Mick had led and then the education work that we did in terms of self-regulation and putting templates together, that then fed into Mick's wonderful individual athlete development plans. And that's why it's so important to have an individual development plan because it does promote buying and ownership. Everyone's on the same page. You have clear, realistic goals timeframes, actions and aligned support that is informed by your smart goal setting philosophy. It also informs the coaching support that you provide and the, the support outside of your coaching from practitioners to support that athlete achieving that goal in a timely manner. It supports a periodic review of your athlete and how you will adapt your approach and the and importantly, um, an individual development plan can link beautifully with an athlete uh, monitoring system as well. So how are they tracking in all those dimensions? And that's some clear objective data there to support um, how they're going. Okay, in terms of smarter practice and integrating all of the skills, and this is touching on training competition, psychological skills and attributes and sports specific skills, my tips for you and my background is skill acquisition and biomechanics and, and uh, as a physiotherapist, I would say don't focus always on the, qual the quantity, focus on the quality of your practice. So what I mean by that is being more ecological in your practice. Now I touched on that the best athletes have this synchrony, this automaticity, you know, their, their perceptual their cognitive and their technical skills working beautifully. You think of the batsman that has milliseconds to adapt and react, you know, to a bowler coming in. Make sure you preserve those where you can in training. You know, if it's in game-based scenarios uh, or you're using, you know, constraints-based learning, 
it's really important to preserve that perception action coupling in your training because that's what it's all about in competition. Make sure you, you bring in a lot of variability in your practice. Uh, so for a cricket batsman, it wouldn't be always in the nets. It might be out in the middle. They'd be facing maybe a left-handed bowler, a right-handed bowler, different types of bowling. So make sure you bring in lots of variability in the practice as well. Practice under fatigue and pressure. That's important because that's a realism of performing in competition. Make sure you embrace variable environmental conditions. You know, if it's, if it's safe to do so and there is a little bit of, um, you know, spit and patter of, um, sorry, of uh, rain, that's okay. You know, if it's a little bit windy, that's okay. That's a realism of competition. So embrace those environmental conditions uh, for practice and incorporate creative play. You know, have a bit of fun with it, you know, with a game-based approach because we know play is a critical vehicle uh, for a lot of uh, development of expertise and honing and bringing together all the skills. Make sure you're using competition to embed learning. So what you learn in practice, competition is a great opportunity to see, you know, it has that worked and really embedding uh, that learning. And remember, importantly, that early maturers with early maturers, so we spoke about late maturers before, on the flip side, you need to have a, a real emphasis um, and support of early maturers as well. So importantly, remember, don't always rely on the physical uh, with them. Make sure that you're supporting them to get this holistic profile and in particular their psychological skills and their technical skills. If you uh, support and, and advocate smarter practice so more about the quality than the quantity and considering these tips it will really help to hone your athlete skill toolkit and facilitate their adaptability, versatility and confidence in competition. In terms of maximising retention and progression these are my tips. And it's drawing, again, you can see in the green, a lot of the, the athlete profile and probably the psychological as well. With retention progression, again, it's multidimensional. You know, it's about monitoring and managing training competition load effectively. So knowing what competitions, how many teams they're in, uh, across what uh, representations, important. It's about neuromuscular conditioning. So not just about strength and conditioning, but posture, and stability uh, as well. It's about sound technique and embracing variability and adaptability in that technique as well. So not one uh, gold standard technique. Uh, it's about the right playing surfaces, footwear and environment, adequate preparation, and there's also importantly, effective recovery, sleep, nutrition, hydration, mood regulation. So as you can see, there's a lot to it. So I would advocate that you visualise, plan and review all of this through a shared, dedicated individual athlete performance plan and make sure you clearly articulate the training but importantly the competition demands of your athletes to make sure that you can effectively manage it, that it is not too much, you know, for these young developing athletes and their bodies periodically review it and adapt the approach and again ensure you have ongoing athlete monitoring to check in and make sure these athletes are coping with the loading on a physical and mental um, side of things. A great resource is the AIS training load in uh, training load guidelines so really um, impress on you to go to the AIS website a wonderful uh, resource informed by uh, world leading evidence uh, has some great recommendations and also um, the International Olympic Committee go to their website they've got a wonderful app called Get Set Train Smarter that has some really great exercises in there for injury prevention. So again, another really great um, resource uh, to check out. In terms of sporting smarts and balance, and this is about uh, what I touched on earlier, having knowledge, putting it into practice, being a good ambassador, having life, sport and life balance. Now really pleased to say at the Office of Sport, we've revamped our path ways and development web pages and if you go to there now we have um, uh, resources and tools for each of these stakeholder groups 
including coaches, including parents, but importantly, emerging athletes. And in there, we've got an assortment of uh, resources and documents and websites that you can go to, again, with a very holistic emphasis, and you can see that them listed here. So I really impress on you to, to go and check them out and give us some feedback um, on these resources. These resources we will change and evolve um, as we get more and more content. Um, as I touch on, really critically important from Lauren's work, and this is from her second paper, that we have balance for our athletes. We know so many athletes that the T3 and T4 level are critical times where there's a lot of churn, a lot of dropout. And it can be not based on performance, but it can be on a lack of adequate balance, um, you know, um, impact on well-being. So it's critically important that you are cognizant of the context of an athlete, have they got support, uh, their well-being is critically important because you as a coach have a fundamental duty of care um, with these athletes. At, within our web pages, I've put some infographics together. Now, this is an infographic based on uh, the best practice principles of FTEM, but also um, these tips, and it's called Supporting Your Emerging Athletes. So tips for you as coaches, but also for parents. So this is something that you could already use uh, with your parent groups to engage them and, and to get them to support you in what you're doing as a coach. All right, just to finally, to, to finish, so thank you. That was a lot of content, but um, look, please go to our website. Um, very soon we'll be able to proudly present and share with you our Future Champions Action Plan, our first one from the strategy. Um, but go there now and you'll see there's a coaches um, part of the website uh, where we've got lots of great uh, resources for you guys as coaches. I wanted to just impress on you this uh, wonderful work that my colleague Simon Wanaski does um, at the Office of Sport. So he runs regular webinars with elite level coaches. I think Mick, you've probably been interviewed too. Um, on there, you can access these webinars um, and they're fantastic uh, resources. So go after these, um, this workshop, um, have, a look, have a look at what we've got online. There you'll also see our FTEM flyer that we've got at the moment, but as I touched on, coming very soon will be our system level considerations of FTEM and then importantly our considerations for coaches as well. Also at the moment, go to the website and you'll see our tips for the emerging athletes, the infographics as well as other uh, tools that you might be able to use with your athletes and parents straight away. And then lastly, we will keep you informed of the great um, Sport Pathways Partnerships and Platform Workshops uh, that we will be running uh, in line with our Future Champions Strategy. Again, another, another wonderful opportunity to probably link online and again, listen to um, experts and practitioners in the field. So look, thank you so much for the opportunity. Always wonderful to connect with you. Um, and I just commend you again on the wonderful work and enjoy the Olympics. <laughs>